Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1980 horror classic, Maniac. Yes, this is uh, available for streaming on Shudder, on the Shudder streaming service when I'm recording this video. I don't actually know when I'm putting this review out, but you know. So I sat down, I'm just giving you the backstory on why I chose Maniac at the moment. I sat down and I was like, oh, what movie do I want to review today? And I had some in mind, but I turned on Shudder. And every time I turn on Shudder, I like to see what they're running on their channels, their live channels. So it just happens that Maniac was on, and I was just like, oh, it's Maniac. And then I found myself not being able to leave it, and I just watched like, I don't know, 10 minutes of it. And then I just was just like, snap out of it, get out of the film. I was like, I'm just going to review this, because I already started to like, have ideas pop up in my head, and I'm like, I'm doing Maniac then. So it just kind of happened. So thank you, Shudder. So anyway, let's talk Maniac. Written by and starring Joe Spinell. Now, this individual you would probably know from Godfather 1 and Godfather 2. He had a bigger role in Godfather 2. He's CC, um, but he's in Godfather 1 as well. He's kind of more like in the background, but you may also know him from Taxi Driver. Now, I've seen the first two Godfather films. I have not seen Taxi Driver. I know there's some people right now with a lot of things I say like that. It would be like, oh my God, you haven't seen Taxi Driver? It's on my list. Don't worry. I'll get to it at some point. But I go hard on the horror, so. But it was also written by C.A. Rosenberg. So Spinell and Rosenberg worked together on the script and story. Directed by William Lustig, who also ended up doing the uh, Maniac Cop series. There were three of those. That was after Maniac. And prior to that, William Lustig actually was a porn director. And so, yeah. Um, I guess he used proceeds from his porn film Hot Honey uh, to film Maniac, so very good. And to that, and to that, uh, the budget actually was a very low three hundred fifty thousand dollars. But get this, how much it made in the box office? Ten million dollars on a three hundred fifty thousand dollar budget. That's awesome. That's huge. And it's really interesting considering that they never, like, initially they didn't submit it for um, rating to the MPAA, so it was just an unrated film. It just immediately gets, like, an NC-17 adults only. Um, there ended up being other cuts of it that were distributed after that at an R rating, but I don't even know. They'd have to cut a decent amount of stuff out to get it down to an R, in my opinion. But... Um, I just thought it was interesting they decided, like, this is so raw, it's so, like, disturbing and gruesome that we're just not even going to get it rated at first and just put it out. But they made $10 million in the box office, so that's crazy. Um, and this was in 1980. The film was not listed as one of the video nasties in the UK, but it actually ended up being seized by police in a few areas of the country just because of the uh, reputation of the film. Because, you know, reputations of films like that kind of make it overseas. So, Lustig, uh, oh yeah, I already said that, the Lust, just Lustig uses proceeds from that porn. Uh, the film was shot guerrilla style because they actually could not afford, uh, afford filming permits for New York City. And yes, that's where it's shot is New York City. So, if you, if you watch this film, just think, whenever they're out on the street doing things, no permits. So... Uh, that's a dicey situation because you can get some very hefty fines if you get caught. Uh, I know one film director in particular who's very famous for like always doing pretty much uh, guerrilla filmmaking is uh, John Waters, who, you know, I'm from the Baltimore-ish area, so he's a hometown hero here. Nice guy. Um, so yeah, all guerrilla style done because it was such a low budget. Now, that takes us to one of the most risky scenes to do guerrilla style, which is the shotgun blast to the head of the boyfriend in the car scene where they're getting it on and then um frank zito joe spinell's character comes up and just like steps up on the top on the hood and just with the shotgun just blows his head open um which that's a crazy scene in the film like it's in amazingly gory it's really well done it looks good and one of the main re reasons being that tom savini did it we all know tom savini he's wonderful uh, and actually, I'm, I'm just going to plug this real quick. I did a uh, review video for the new Tom, the Tom Savini uh, documentary, which is also streaming on Shutter, called um, I think it's Smoke and Mirrors: The Life of Tom Savini. Check out that review and check out the documentary. So, because Tom Savini, obviously, we know is amazing with his practical effects. So he already happened to have a um, a mold of his head, a reproduction of his own head. So they used that, and he just played the boyfriend in that role. So that's Tom Savini. 
and then um, they did a shotgun, a real shotgun blast through the windshield to blow up the head, and they filled it with a bunch of fake blood and, like, leftover food is what I read. <laughs> I was like, okay, random, but, it, you know, it works. So, um, very effective. But this is the thing. Without having a filming permit, that's really, really dicey, and they knew that going into it. So, basically, how they did it is when they were going to shoot the scene of the actual shotgun blast happening, they had a friend's truck next to them so that they shoot the scene with the shotgun blast then immediately throw the shotgun in the bed of the truck and that truck takes off so that there's no gun in the vicinity in case the cops show up fast so smart thinking but man is it risky to do something like that but it's also just in general risky to shoot a serial killer film without a permit because you could be mistaken for an actual serial killer like they're doing creepy things when they're filming it's weird so, I don't, yeah, that stuff's rough. I feel like in those instances, you should just try to find the money to get those permits, especially in a place like New York City. It's a very crowded city, even back then. So, I mean, obviously it's more so today, but... So, um, do 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 There was a Maniac 2 that ended up coming out in 1986. Uh, interesting thing, 1986 was also the year that Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer came out, which I feel like took a lot of inspiration from Maniac. Um, but uh, Spinell actually ended up directing Maniac 2. I have not seen Maniac 2. I probably will at some point because I have a lot of respect for Joe Spinell, especially after I've seen Maniac. And this viewing, when I watched it today, this was not the first time I'd seen it. I saw it a few years ago. So uh, Then there was a remake in 2012 that was done by Alexander Aja, and that starred Elijah Wood. I've heard very good things about that remake. I just haven't gotten to it yet. Once again, it's one of those films. It's on the list. It's on my list to watch. I will get there eventually. And I'll probably do a review of it when I get there. So, let's get in the actual film. The opening scene sets a very disturbing and very important uh, stage for the film. To give you an idea of what type of film it is. You do find out that that's, you know, a dream or a nightmare kind of that that uh, Frank Zito was having, but you start immediately with this kind of like voyeuristic view of him using those, it's like those touristy binocular things you can pay for. I don't think they have those anymore, except like on the tops of tall buildings in, in big cities. But, um, so he's like looking through that, so it looks like binoculars basically. And the heavy, like the, the disturbing heavy breathing is very effective because it tells you there's something not right about this person. And that's like an immediate thing to let you know, hey, the this voyeuristic gaze that you're seeing, the person who's watching is messed up in some way. And you're going to find out how. And you obviously you do with very gory effect. Um, and like that kill scene is actually very crazy and disturbing how he's like lifted up and you see his feet and they're like shaking. It's, it's a very raw, disturbing film. And I see why it, you know, got the reputation it did when it came out. I mean rightfully so with the way that it was done um but you know for nowadays people really look back and appreciate how it was done because it's very realistic um you see how unhinged frank is immediately with his dream and then um because he wakes up from the dream he's all sweaty which that's kind of a theme is like frank zito is always sweaty in this film which i feel like adds an extra level of like disturbing and grit to the film and, and like rawness it's just, like, it's gross, you know? Like, how often in films do they intentionally show the actors, like, sweaty? Not very often. So it, it, it gives this kind of raw, authentic feel to the film. It's a small thing, but it works. So when he wakes up from his dream, like, you then... I mean, first of all, he had that crazy dream, but then also you're seeing his room where he's got, like, all the dolls, the mannequins, um, all these pictures. And if you'll notice, some of the pictures have, like, the private parts uh, kind of... Um, scratched out of the women and that kind of goes back to his whole psychosis um, well his his whole disturbing behavior that spawns from his mother and the sexuality that he saw in his mother uh, basically as they allude to it being like a prostitute when he was a kid so um, very 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 interesting so they have a lot of those kind of cues there where where they give you some hints as to what's going on with his backstory, but then they eventually, over the course of the film, actually break it down. 
which is one of the things I really like about this film, especially for how early it was in 1980, to go that in-depth on the pathology of a serial killer like this. Um, I feel like that was pretty groundbreaking. I mean, you did see some of that in the, in the Hitchcock film Psycho, but I feel like this took it deeper and closer because it's focusing on that main character of the serial killer. It's like you're inside his head, basically, which helps to make the film more disturbing and more uncomfortable for people. So therefore more effective. Uh, Frank goes out to kill the hooker because the, his dream kind of signified that he was like jonesing for a kill. You know, it's part of him waking up all sweaty as he was kind of like, it's like a junkie, you know, like when they wake up and they've got the sweats, they're just like, I just need a fix. I need a fix. Frank Zito just needed a kill fix. And that's why he then goes out, gets the hooker and does his thing, which, you know, that's his, that's, that's his thing. Um, so the scalping scene I thought was actually pretty nasty for 1980. So you pair that up with the head explosion and um, some of the stabbing stuff. Uh, the one with the, uh, the stabbing through the back with the bayonet and then him stabbing the girl with his switchblade and then him stabbing himself. Like all those scenes, very, very gory, very gruesome. So the inner monologue is actually a little bit weird, but the line delivery in it's really good. And, you know, that mainly just being that Joe Spinell did an excellent job in this role. And it's a tough role. It's a very, very tough role, but he did an outstanding job. Um, but yeah, like there's a, he's got the inner monologue going on after he killed that first hooker and he and he brings her scout back and he's putting the mannequin together and everything. I don't feel like the inner monologue works. It's very weird. He could have just been talking out loud and it would have made more sense uh, because that's the only time the inner monologue really happens and then they just like drop it. So when you do something like that, like stick with it. And then people kind of get used to it or don't do it. Like, do it throughout or don't do it at all. So that's one of my small criticisms. Then I was watching and I was like, with such a low budget, how did they end up getting that um, that helicopter shot of the city? And I'm wondering if maybe it was like some sort of stock footage they were able to get somewhere. Or knew someone who had that kind of footage and they, they got it. I don't know. But I was assumed they would not be, with such a low budget, they wouldn't be able to like you know, rent a helicopter and do that. So Frank's having relationships with the mannequins, we know, but he needs the scalps in order to make them feel real. So he can have the relationships with these mannequins because you see, like, in his interactions with them, he's treating them like real people and mainly his mother. He treats all women basically like his mother when he's in that, you know, more um, evil mindset the the serial killer mindset because there are kind of two segments to him there's there's a normal a more normal him and a more evil him and the more evil him is is, is signified by that kind of heavy breathing and those kind of like guttural noises that he makes like that's a very smart film choice to give that kind of auditory cue to the listeners that oh he's his brain has switched right now and you see that a few times in the film so you see him having these relationships with these mannequins, but he needs those scalps because he needs something to make it feel real. And I guess for him, it's the actual human hair that makes that happen. Um, so it becomes apparent that he can't actually coexist with real women because he has to have a lot of control. And as you see with the relationship that he tries to have with Anna, the photographer, that he, he can only maintain what he feels like control for so long. Because he has that moment where he gets like super jealous and she's like, oh, you can come and see me at uh, this film shoot. And he's like, yeah, with a bunch of other guys. And she even like points it out, like you're getting jealous. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. Uh, but he is like he and that signifies like his need for control over women. Because when he was a child, he had no control over the main woman in his life that he loved his mother. And she was actually super horrible to him, obviously. So he can really only be in an actual relationship because of this with a dead woman or a fake woman being the mannequins. Uh, the subway stalking scene is particularly well done and I feel like very, very tense. Also, it's a good location choice for the reasons of one, it's just more of like a desolate, dirty uh, setting that, that kind of like ratchets up the horror of it, but also the aspect of if you're doing that guerrilla style filmmaking, you can definitely find a time where people aren't really using it as much. So it's a little bit easier to get those shots out in the public. 
Um, so Zito's relationship with the photographer Anna seems a bit fast to me. That's one of my other kind of issues is there, there should, should have been a little bit more story because he comes and talks to her and is just like, oh, I do paintings. I think he says he does paintings. And then she's just like, oh, you're, you're also a creative person. I like you now. Let's, you know, go out on a date. And it's like, that's a little bit fast and weird. doesn't really make sense. Especially because, let's say it, Joe Spinell is not a good looking guy. Therefore, Frank Zito is not a good-looking guy. So, he is charismatic in the film when he's acting normal, but he's not a good-looking guy. Uh, you get the idea Frank's mom was a hooker based on the apartment break-in scene. That's before you get, like, the confirmation that, that that's what was going on. Um, and you also understand that she was putting cigarettes out on him when her Johns came over. Um, so that's a very, very revealing scene, and therefore it's a very, very important scene. It's not just another one of those kills. And that's the thing, is a lot of the times they're using the scenes in this film not just as, here's shock value, here's something interesting. They're using it to actually push the story forward and give you more of Zito's backstory so you understand what's really going on, how he got to where he is. And I feel like the writing of the script is very, very good for that reason. Uh, Frank tried his hardest to keep it together in front of Anna, but it's really hard to do that when his biggest trigger in life is right there, his his mother's headstone. Like, I knew, when, the first time I watched this film, I knew when he was like, oh, let's go to the cemetery and see my mom, I was just like, oh, he's he is going to lose it because that's his biggest trigger. And to be, like, in her presence, obviously, just sends him over the edge, and even further, because you don't even you don't see him like hallucinating until that moment, until he's closest to his the biggest trigger in his life, uh, and then he's hallucinating, and obviously she like jumps out of the ground and is like I guess kind of trying to strangle him or something, abuse him from beyond the grave once again. So uh, you get the idea that Frank's inability to reconcile his normal side with his evil side is what kind of drives him in the end to hallucinate and then eventually kill himself. At first, you don't really know what's going on. You're like, did we just become like supernatural and like the ghosts of his victims are actually killing him or is this all in his head or what's going on? I expected the first time I watched it that he was um, just kind of hallucinating that and then he would, you know, still be fine. But then you see when the police showed up that he actually stabbed himself with the bayonet but then you also see at the very, very end that he opens his eyes. So maybe he's still alive. I don't know. So I guess I have to see Maniac 2. Then that'll tell me. Although I'm not even 100% sure that that's um, connected. Because it might not be. But I'll have to see. Okay, so that's it about the actual like events of the movie. So let me talk about some of the other stuff. So there are moments when Frank makes those guttural noises, yeah, and the heavy breathing, which is meant to signify that mental change. And it lets you know at, at those moments that he's thinking about terrible things. So I think for me, one of the most important of those moments is the one where he's at the photo shoot to see Anna. And it's important because prior to that scene, there was a very large portion of him acting normal. And seeming like a normal guy and being charismatic and being trying to be in like a normal relationship with Anna. But then when he meets that um, Rita, when he meets Rita, the model, uh, then she walks away and, and he's sitting by himself. That's when you notice the change in the breathing. And he's making like these guttural noises at the same time, too. And that's why that scene is particularly important, because it shows the most contrast between him being normal and making that switch. Like, it's the best stage where you really, really, really notice it. So really, really well done. Uh, they do a great job of laying out the backstory for Frank's pathology, his issue with losing his mother, and his idea that a picture preserves a person like the picture of his mother, but also like the mannequin is like a preserved person, and the scalp is also a perverse, preserved person. So that conversation that he has with Anna prior to the photo shoot, where they kind of first meet, like really meet, um, that's a really interesting, really important uh, dialogue between the two characters because they're talking about, it, it gives you a, more of a glimpse into his mind of like, oh, well, I'm preserved. You know, if you take this picture, then they are preserved forever. And then he ends up showing the picture of his mother, giving you the idea that he believes his mother is kind of preserved forever in this picture. But then he's also seeing his mother in other women. 
and that is preserving her as well. And then that's why he wants to get close to him because he sees his mother in them, and then he needs to preserve some piece of them with the mannequin, which is the scalp. Um, Frank has self-confidence issues, so at the slightest indicator that a woman may step out on him or another guy may swoop in, he goes off the deep end. That was kind of a little bit of what I got out of the situation with Anna, where, you know, he, it seemed like things were going well for him and he hadn't kind of like lapsed back to being a homicidal maniac. Uh, but he then eventually gets there because I feel like all the stress, the stressors that kind of hit him of feeling like things are going well with Anna and then feeling like there are a bunch of indicators that there's a lot of um, doubt in the ability to maintain the relationship or move it forward. And then that's when he meets Rita and then that's when his breathing changes and he just kind of goes back to being the serial killer self that he is. So it really does feel like in this film there's a bit of an opportunity for him to go away from being a serial killer and he does that for a little bit, but then he inevitably goes back. So it, it's kind of like the struggle, like I was talking about earlier, of him kind of being a junkie, being addicted to drugs. It's that struggle of can he stay clean in a sense, but then he gets the the urge. He, gets, he starts jonesing for it, and he just can't get away. Uh, the allure for some and repulsion for others with this film came from how up close and personal this film was was with the actual killer, I feel like. Like I was saying before, you like get inside of his head, but it, there's also a level, 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 sorry, level of discomfort that comes in knowing the backstory of how he got to where he is. And being able to feel a level of sympathy for what happened to him in his past, because I feel like you get there. And when he's a terrible person and he does the obviously terrible things that are depicted in this film... You don't want to like him. You don't want to feel any sort of positive or sympathetic feeling for him. But when you do, because of that backstory that you find out, it makes you uncomfortable. Because you're like, I'm feeling a bit of sympathy for this person, but this person's terrible. And so feeling so conflicted is very, very uncomfortable. And I feel like that's one of the reasons that this film disturbs people to the level that it does. The other aspect being the violence and the gore, obviously. But... So Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer came six years after Maniac, like I was saying before, um, and people freaked out about that movie as well, saying it was like so intense and over the top and just too much. But I feel like Maniac is way more disturbing. I f and I hear a lot more people talk about Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer than I hear talk about Maniac in, in that regard. And I feel like if you're going to talk about that, you should probably mainly talk about Maniac. You can talk about Hen Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer as well, because it is also kind of that level of disturbing. But um, I feel like Maniac feels even more raw and more close to the serial killer and more um, disturbing, just in general. To up the ante of being disturbing and gross, oh, I already talked about this, the disturbing and gross aspect being upped by... Frank Zito being so sweaty all the time. Uh, it's a weird choice, and some people are probably more grossed out about it, but I like the choice. I do. Um, once again, Spinell did an outstanding job with this role, a tough role. He did a really good job. Uh, I really dug his performance. Too bad he passed away in 1989. So uh, this, fi this film points out how much a person can be messed up when the one they love most as a child is their worst abuser. And I feel like that is the core theme of this film, is how parenting matters that much. And, you know, just like I said, like how messed up a person can become because they have the trauma, they have traumas in their childhood, especially when it's tied to a parent. And, you know, it kind of goes back to Psycho, the Hitchcock film Psycho, where, you know, Norman Bates is so tied to his mother, so has so much love for his mother that it causes him psychological problems in his adulthood. And I feel like Maniac's kind of inspired by that, but it takes it to the next level and it gets way deeper on his backstory and actually gets kind of sympathetic because there is a little bit of that in Psycho, but I feel like in Maniac there's a lot more. So anyway, this film is a good film, quite a good film. Um, so I'm going to have to give it a star rating out of five. Out of five star stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give this a four and a half. This is a very well put together film. Uh, I dig it. I think 
especially with such a low budget. They did an unbelievable job with the practical effects, the acting, the script writing was great. The music was really good in it. The directing was, excuse me, the directing was quite well pulled off. Um, yeah, it really comes together, and it's it's a horror classic at this point. So anyway, thank you everyone for checking this out. Put some comments down there. What are your thoughts on Maniac? Uh, also, have you seen Maniac 2, and have you seen the remake? Let me know if those are musts for me. Also, Maniac, the Maniac Cop series. Let me know about that. I heard good things about the first Maniac Cop, so I'll probably just check that one out. But tell me about the other ones, too. Uh, so put those comments down there. You can give me a like. But the big thing is, repay me with a subscribe. If you're not already subscribed, if you already are, big thank you to you. But I keep, I get motivated to keep doing these if you hit that subscribe. So that'd be appreciated. But thank you so much for checking this one out. And until next time, keep it brutal.